Okay, in today's class, we come to the second main division of the course. And this is the division that I call the happiness pertaining to future life. Okay, when I (laughs) use the expression future life, for many people, especially Westerners, this immediately raises the question, what does one mean by future lives? Isn't this the only life that we live? (laughs) Well, according to the Buddha, this isn't the only life that we live. But the Buddha very clearly and literally and explicitly teaches a principle that we can call rebirth. He holds that this life is not the only life that we live, but this life is just one link in a beginningless chain of lives. The chain of lives that goes back into the inconceivable unimaginable past. And just as any birth is followed by death, so death for all unenlightened beings will be followed by a new birth. It's sometimes thought that the Buddha just accepted the doctrine of rebirth because that was part of the Indian cultural package, part of the belief, one of, part, part of the belief system and the milieu that he had to teach him. But actually, if you really read the discourses carefully, you see that this is not the case at all. The Buddha explicitly says that rebirth, the rebirth of beings is something that he has seen for himself understood for himself, something that he has realized for himself with direct knowledge. And so the doctrine of rebirth is far from being a dispensable aspect of the Buddha's teaching, actually provides its underlying background the background against which the whole teaching of the Dhamma unfolds. Rebirth is not the same thing as reincarnation. Reincarnation, we see the word reincarnation, implies that there is an entity like a soul or a self which transmigrates from one body to another body. The Indian classic, the Bhagavad Gita, non-Buddhist work, uses the simile of a man who might own many suits of clothes, and so he takes off one suit of clothes, puts on another suit of clothes, then later in the day he puts on still another suit of clothes, And that is similar to the way the body, uh, similar to the way the soul takes on one body after another. And that is the 
Dominic belief in rebirth as a kind of reincarnation of the soul. But the Buddhist teaching doesn't accept the existence of a substantial soul or a substantial self that persists unchanged, preserving its personal identity. In the Buddha's teaching, individual existence is a process, not an entity. It's a process which involves the flow of conditioned phenomena. These are called sankharas, condition formation. And the different phases or stages within this process are linked together by laws of causation and conditionality. So within this stream of experience, any act of experience or occasion of experience arises, persists just for a brief moment, and then passes away to be followed by a new occasion of experience. And it is the succession of these moments or acts of experience that constitutes the basis for our sense of personal identity. In this process, we distinguish two aspects, two sides, like the heads and tails of a coin. One side is the side of bodily or physical existence. And the other side is the mental or psychic side of existence. And in our normal experience, these two aspects are inextricably bound together. The mental process in our experience always occurs with the support of the bodily process. In our human lives, the body with its sense faculties serves as the necessary basis for all experience, for all conscious experience. Under the influence of modern science, we're inclined to believe that the mind is entirely dependent on the body. We suppose that the mind is just, in this way, a kind of byproduct of physical processes. And then we suppose that with the death of the body, with the extinction of life, the mental process also comes to a complete end. This is the basic materialist view of human existence. That mind has no true reality in itself, but it's just a byproduct of matter or a function of material phenomena. But for Buddhism, this would be a misunderstanding, even an erroneous viewpoint. From the, step, from the perspective of the Buddha's teaching, when we take these two sides, the mental and the physical, the mental side is actually more basic, more fundamental. Of course, the mental side can only exist with the support of the body. But from the understanding of the Buddha, the body or life is a channel for the transmission of the mental process. And at death, the mental process 
will always find a way of connecting to a new physical process in order to continue its onward movement. Rebirth is not the transmigration of a soul to a new body, but it is the continuation of the mental process on the basis of a new physical body. So when the old physical body decays in old age, then when death strikes, the physical body can no longer serve as a support for this stream of experience, this flow or process of consciousness. But as long as there is grasping or clinging, when the connection between the mental process and body is broken by death, the bodily process will move on and find, uh, the mental process will move on and find a new physical support on the basis of which it will continue its flow. We might compare this, to use an analogy, it's somewhat like a candle, a burning candle. And we have the flame burning the wax of the body of the candle. The flame is like the mind. The body of the candle is like the physical body. And so the flame of the candle burns on the basis of the body of the candle. And as long as there's enough body to the candle, that flame will keep on burning. But the flame is not an entity, but it's a process, always changing. It's always burning the new portion of the wick. It's always burning new molecules of oxygen and giving off carbon dioxide. And it's <laughs> burning the body of the candle lower and lower and lower. And then suppose we reach a point where the candle is almost finished, then we want to continue to have light. We take another candle and put its wick to the flame of the old candle. And so the flame passes over to the wick of the new candle. And then the old candle burns out and then we have a new candle. So we don't think of the flame as being a solid entity that passes over from the old candle to the new candle, but the flame itself is a process, always changing, a process of burning, of consumption. And so the mind, too, is always in process always changing. Sometimes it always has a different object, sometimes form, sometimes sound, sometimes smell, sometimes taste, sometimes touch objects, sometimes thoughts. But as long as the physical body remains healthy, and the lie, the mind process will continue to burn on the basis of this bodily support. So when the bodily support loses its vitality, when death comes, then the flame of the mental process will pass over to a new body, which is like the candle, a new candle. But even though this mental continuum or stream of consciousness remains continuous from life to life, 
the sense of personal identity almost always changes from life to life. So each life will involve quite a distinct personality. We don't think of when I die and take rebirth that it's going to be the new personality is going to be exactly the same as myself. Hope it won't. <laughs> but these different lives belong to the same stream of experience and they are linked by deep underlying connections. So each life, in each life, the surface personality will arise out of the massive accumulation of past experiences. So will be shaped, partly shaped by the established tendencies of character, the personality traits, even the habits, the likes and dislikes of the previous personality. And all of these character traits, features of the personality, have all been created in each life by our own thoughts, our desires, our aspirations, and our activities. So, one's personality in this life has been shaped by your actions, your thoughts, your desires, your tendencies of previous life. And whatever, whatever way you act in this life, whatever desires arise, whatever aspirations, dispositions take shape, these will become conditioning factors that will shape the personality that will arise in your stream of experience in the next life, in the lives after that. There isn't anything mystical or occult about this, but it is quite, you say almost that everything occurs in a quite scientific way. It's just that it's out of the range of our ordinary vision, our ordinary means of sensory access. And what keeps this process flowing, moving from life to life, is the existence of ignorance, craving, and clinging within the mind stream. Okay, when I speak about the stream of consciousness passing into a new body, I have to add a qualification to that, that it does not necessarily happen that a rebirth will occur immediately after death. In fact, I personally suspect that in the case of human existence, this very seldom happens. So far as I can gather from acquaintance of reports on people who have recollections of previous lives. When the gross physical body dies, that is when medical professionals will pronounce the person dead, there still remains a kind of subtle body, which is composed of a subtle matter. And this will function as the support for the consciousness until suitable conditions appear in the human world for the deceased being to be reborn here. That is, if the being is to be, is destined to be reborn in the human realm. 
but it is also possible for consciousness to take rebirth elsewhere than in the human realm. According to the Buddha's teaching, there are many planes of existence, many realms of being, many dimensions of reality inhabited by living beings. And these are realms into which we ourselves might take rebirth if the causes and conditions that we create propel us towards those realms. So when we think of a being from one realm taking rebirth into another realm, one shouldn't think, for example, that John Smith becomes an, <laughs> an animal. So that we shouldn't think that this cow is the same person as John Smith. But it's rather that through the stream of consciousness that was functioning in John Smith, if he was leading a bovine type existence, <laughs> when he passes away, then that stream of consciousness will manifest in the form of a cow, or will connect with the body of a cow coming into being. To illustrate this, I'd like to use a simile of the current of electricity that's coming out from the socket in a wall. And if we plug into that socket during the cold, the cold season, we plug into the socket in electric heater and then turn on the machine, then we get heat. When the seasons change, it becomes summer, very hot, we don't want the heater anymore, so we remove it from the wall and we plug in an air conditioner and turn it on, and we get cool air. So it's the same current of electricity coming out from the same socket, but if you plug in a heater, you get warmth. If you plug in an air conditioner, a refrigerator, you get cold. So the electricity will manifest in different ways depending upon the appliance that one plugs into the wall, into the socket. So it's a similar way with the energy of the stream of consciousness. If there are the causes and creations for manifesting as a human being, then it will acquire all of the characteristics of human consciousness. If there are the causes and conditions for manifesting as a cow, then there will be a, a cow. <laughs> okay, the primary factor that governs the process of rebirth is something that the Buddha calls kama in Pali, or better known by the Sanskrit word karma. Okay. Nowadays in various New Age circles, they still use the word New Age. I remember that from the late 1960s. Now it's 40 years of <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of kind of mystique is created around this expression karma. But the word karma is a very simple Sanskrit word which means action or deed. It's from the root kar, the verb karoti, to do. And this idea of karma was existing in India during the Buddha's time. There was a general understanding that there is a process of rebirth, that we are reborn repeatedly from life to life. 
and that the factor that determines our mode of existence is our karma. And so the Buddha's understanding of the human situation is very much in agreement with this general understanding of the Indian tradition. But the Buddha took this word karma and gave it a very precise definition. The Buddha narrowed down the meaning of karma to volitional action. He says, Chaitanaham bhikave kamang vadami, which means it is volition that I call karma. So the essential factor in the creation of karma is the presence of volition, intention, will. And it is only actions that spring from volition, actions that are expressive of one's intentions, that are called karma. And in the Buddha's understanding, all ethical, let's say, ethically determinate volitional actions, all actions that spring from volition and that have some ethical quality, either good or bad, have a capacity, a potential to produce results that correspond to the ethical nature of the original action. These results are called the fruits of karma, karma pala. The governing principle behind this relationship between karma and its fruits is the rule that morally good actions produce desirable, agreeable results, and morally blameworthy actions produce undesirable, disagreeable results. The text gives the simile of planting seeds and harvesting the corresponding crops. So if one plants soybeans or soybean seeds, one will get soybean crops as a result. If you plant soybeans, you don't get oranges. <laughs> At least in, back then we didn't get oranges. I don't know what the scientists are doing nowadays. <laughs> I've heard of fish genes being put into tomatoes, so who knows? <laughs> but if one plants apple seeds and they grow, then one will get apple trees and apples. One doesn't get soybeans from apple seeds. Okay, karma can produce its results in three periods of time. First, karma can bring its results in this very life itself. So that when we do some volitional actions, these actions might bring their fruits within this very same life. Maybe one example that comes to mind in 2001, March 2001, 
the Taliban in Afghanistan blew up these two ancient Buddha statues in Danyan. A few months later, what happened to the Taliban? <laughs> no longer in power. <laughs> Perhaps that was the fruit of that karma. Okay, so fruits of karma can mature in this life itself. The second way is that they can mature in the immediately following life. And the third way is they can mature in some more distant life after the following life. Okay, sometimes a karma might have the potential to produce its results either in this life or in the next life. But if it does not meet with suitable conditions, then that karma will not have the opportunity to produce its results. And then that karma becomes extinct. It loses all potential to produce its results. This is somewhat like having seeds and if those seeds don't meet the conditions for ripening and then the seed gets burnt by the sun or damaged in some way so that it's not capable of ripening, then it won't ripen at all. But other seeds might be kept in storage for a long, long time, even for years, then they're planted and they will ripen and bear their fruits. Okay, when karma ripens, it can ripen in two ways. This is the call of two functions of karma. One is that karma might generate the type of rebirth that a being, the living being, takes. So karma is, in this function, it is because the determining, determining cause for taking rebirth into a particular realm of existence and under particular conditions. So, whenever a human being is born, a baby is born, that baby has been born as a human being because of a past karma which has steered that being, directed that being towards a human type of rebirth, towards the human realm. Okay, the second way in which karma can ripen is during the course of our lives. That is, as we go on with our life, then we meet sometimes favorable conditions, sometimes unfavorable conditions. Desi we meet with desirable situations, agreeable and pleasant situations, and undesirable, disagreeable, obstructive situations and experiences. And we can see these as being the manifestations the fruits of past karma. But we shouldn't understand that everything that happens to us is always and necessarily the result of karma. What we can say is that from the standpoint of the cause, looking to the effect, a particular karmic action will have the tendency to produce certain results, agreeable or disagreeable. 
So we shouldn't think that everything that happens to us is the result of our previous karma. There are various other conditioning factors involved. Okay, so far I've been speaking about karma in a very general way, but the most important fact about karma is the distinction that the Buddha makes between two broad types of karma. This is where the ethically determinate nature of the karma comes in. That the Buddha distinguishes karma into two broad categories the unwholesome and the wholesome. In Pali, this is called akusala and kusala karma. I like those words now. Okay, the word akusala is what we translate as unwholesome, Some, sometimes it's translated unskillful. And akkosala karma is explained as actions that are, we could say from, this is explained from three points of view, from a psychological point of view, from the moral point of view, and from the point of view of its results. So, unwholesome karma is action which is psychologically unhealthy. When we engage in these kinds of actions, they have a degenerative effect upon our minds. They darken the mind lead to the deterioration of the higher potentials, higher faculties of the mind, pull the mind downwards, create conflict, disturbance, agitation. From the moral point of view, unwholesome karma is morally reprehensible. It's actions which are open to blame and criticism from those with a refined ethical sense. And in terms of its results, unwholesome karma is karma which is productive, which tends to be, to be productive of undesirable results. It's action which will, if it brings its fruit, it will ripen in pain and suffering and create various obstacles for us. Okay, wholesome karma, kusala karma, is just the opposite. This is action which from the psychological standpoint is called, you can call healthy. That is, it's actions which clear up the mind, which make the mind light, joyful, calm, self-confident. It's morally, from the moral point of view, it's morally commendable actions, actions which will be generally approved of by those with a developed ethical sensitivity. And from the standpoint of its results, its action, karma, which is productive of desirable results, karma that will lead to well-being, to happiness, to situations that are conducive to our own progress and well-being.
that karmas or actions come to manifestation in three ways. We have what the Buddha calls, or what the Buddhist text calls, the three doors of action. The Pali word dvara is actually etymologically connected to the English word door. Dwar, door. <clears throat> so the volitions are things which begin deep within our minds. And then they come to manifestation in three ways. Sometimes the volition will express itself through the body in the form of bodily action. So the body is one door of action, the door through which bodily karma is created. The second door is the door of speech. Even though the tongue is just a very small instrument, very small organ, but it cre can create so much either misery or happiness for others. And so the tongue, the mouth, is a very important instrument of action. It's through speech that wars arise, <laughs> even though they're fought with the body, but it's through speech. And we could also bring writing into the domain of verbal or vocal karma. This writing is in a way, though it's a bodily act, but it's giving expression to ideas, feelings that ordinarily would be expressed by speech. And the third door of karma is called the mind door. This is when the karma remains inside simply in the form of thoughts, desires, judgments, but doesn't come to expression directly in bodily action or in speech. Okay, and then the basis for distinguishing karma. On what basis is our actions distinguished as being unwholesome or wholesome. According to the Buddhist teaching, our ethically determinate volitions arise through the influence of certain other psychological factors, which the Buddhist texts call the roots of karma. And so there are three roots of unwholesome karma. What are these three roots? Greed or craving, hatred or anger, aversion. Ill will. And the third is delusion or ignorance. And out of those three roots arise many other unwholesome mental states that might also become motives for action. Mental states like <clears throat> jealousy, envy, arrogance, contempt for others, insolence, Laziness, restlessness, 
disrespect, pride, let's call it false pride. Many, many secondary defilements arise from the three unwholesome roots. And then also from the three unwholesome roots and the other unwholesome mental states, there arise unwholesome karma. And the three wholesome roots are the opposites. The Buddhist texts call them non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion. But these are umbrella terms. Each one is an umbrella term for a variety of wholesome qualities. Like non-greed will include generosity and non-attachment, the ability to relinquish, to give up in order to be of benefit to others. Non-hatred will include qualities like loving-kindness, gentleness, compassion, concern for the well-being of others, and non-delusion means understanding, insight, clarity of mind, wisdom. Okay, now since karma is the key factor in determining rebirth, we come to the question, where does karma produce rebirth? It's not only into the human realm, but Buddhism speaks about the whole universe of living beings as being constituted of what are called the three realms of existence. These realms are the sense sphere. This is this realm in which sensual desire is the strongest motivating factor of being. Okay, the sense there is divided into two main sections. One is the bad destinations, the, okay, the painful destinations, and these will be the hell realms, the animal realm, and the realm of the praetors. The praetors sometimes translated hungry ghosts. Maybe unhappy spirits might be a better translation. And these are realms in which there's generally a predominant preponderance of suffering over happiness. Then the good destinations in the sense there realm are the human world and the Happy sense their heavens, the sense their heavens. The heavens are occupied by beings that we call gods, but these are not powerful, all powerful creator gods. These are just living beings that are living at a higher realm of existence where they have extremely long lifespans. They don't have the labor and travail of the human, of human existence. They experience bliss and happiness much of the time. But they're still in the grip of sensual desire, desire for enjoyment of sense pleasures. 
Above the sensor realm is the, what is called the form realm. These are very subtle worlds in which there's still material form, but the material form has become very subtle, very refined. And the beings here spend most of their time in deep meditative absorption. And then beyond the form realm is what is called the formless realm. In the formless realm, there is no material substance at all. The beings here consist only of mind. Don't ask me to describe what it's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what it's like to have just mind with no physical substance at all. And these beings also spend most of their time in deep meditative absorption. And even though we picture these realms as being arranged one above the other like this, we shouldn't think that they're really in some kind of physical hierarchical relationship. The way I think of these realms, I think of them as being different vibrational frequencies and that a particular realm will manifest to us depending upon the vibrational frequencies of our own mo mode of consciousness. So if we have, if through our karma we're destined to come into the human realm, then our consciousness will operate on the vibrational frequency of the human realm and the human realm will appear to us. If through our actions we do a lot of wholesome karma so that we're destined to take rebirth in one of the heavenly realms, then our vibrational frequency will change at rebirth so that a heavenly realm will manifest. Okay, some of you might be thinking, we are educated Americans, with maybe some of you are scientists, who have a scientific background, so you could think, how could we be expected to believe this ancient Indian mythology? Doesn't seem to have any real basis. Well, if I were to tell you right now, in this room there are voices speaking French, speaking Spanish, speaking Chinese, speaking Japanese, speaking Arabic, speaking Hebrew, speaking German. I don't mean people who can speak these languages, but voices right now that are speaking in those languages. What would you think about me? You'd probably ask, is there a psychiatrist in the room? <laughs> if I take a shortwave radio and turn it on, I get Radio Germany, I get German speech, I get Radio Italy, Italian speech. If I get a radio station broadcasting from 
Mexico, I will get, or from Spain, I get Spanish being spoken. If I turn on Radio Korea, I get Korean spoken. Where are those voices coming from speaking these languages? It's not because I'm plugging it in the wall. They're not coming through the electricity in the wall. The languages are not in the radio. But there are vibrations, waves, radio waves, traveling through this room all the time, carrying on discussions, announcements, conversations, in all of these different languages. But we're not hearing them because we don't have the suitable instrument. If you have the suitable instrument, then you get the voices that are speaking those languages, not the imagination. And so we could say that all of these realms are occurring, maybe even within the same spatial framework. But our consciousness is operating only along the radio band that will pick up the human realm. And of course we'll see the animal realm also. But things like the hell realms, the heavenly realms, we have no experience of. We have no perceptual access to because our minds are not able to pick them up. It was possible through the development of the mind in meditation to sort of come in through the back door and to perceive directly these different realms. Okay, maybe at this point, before we go into the text, I'll ask whether there's any questions. There's a, a microphone. Um, each of the realms is still on the birth. To get into the realm, it takes birth. Birth will, the first, see, the occasion of entry into the realm is birth, yeah. Is there an optimum? What the Buddhist texts say is that the optimal realm is the human realm. Even though the human realm is just one of the six, it's one of the good destinations in the sense sphere in terms of its the cosmic hierarchy, it's not very high up. But the, realm, the reason is that in the human realm, there's a mixture of happiness and suffering. And also, it's the lifespan in the human realm is not so short that we can't develop ourselves spiritually, and it's not so long that we become complacent about our existence. And so the Buddhist texts say that the human realm is considered the ideal realm from the standpoint of liberation. Okay, let's take each question, one question at a time. 
The first question is, how did bad karma ever arise? Okay, so where does where does unrighteousness come from? It's a cosmic law, it's righteousness. Well, in fact, there's a cosmic law. I call it the law of righteousness in the sense that the Dhamma is a principle of righteous or ideal action. But the fact that there is this law pervading the universe doesn't mean that everybody's action is going to be righteous. <laughs> you could say that Dhamma in this aspect is the law, or at least part of the aspect of Dhamma, is the law that governs the working of karma so that good actions, wholesome actions, will produce desirable results and bad actions will produce unwholesome results. Bad actions will produce undesirable results. And to this I have to add very important a clarification. The results of karma should not be thought of as rewards and punishments, in that there's no deity sort of overseeing the working of karma, who when a person behaves well will reward him with good experiences, when a person behaves badly will punish him with a bad rebirth and unpleasant experiences. But the production of results through the karmas, through the actions, is a natural process. This is the working of the natural law. And there's no beginning to this process, so that there's the question of when unwholesome or evil karma could ever have arisen, <coughs> could ever have started. This is a question which is, we would have to say, illegitimate, because there's no beginning to the process. But as far back as one goes, there have always been living beings like ourselves, in fact, ourselves in earlier lives, facing the choices of good action or bad action, wholesome or unwholesome choices. Okay, then the second question, maybe rephrase, rephrase it again. Okay. Um, in a conditioned world, um, in the initial conditioned world, one existence reflects and lies, and karma was thereby generated. Okay, okay, this is an important question. When I say that, or Buddhism says that everything in this world is conditioned, it doesn't mean that everything in this world, that everything that happens is strictly determined or irreversibly determined. There are always conditions acting upon us, but against the basis of these conditions, we make choices. Um, let's maybe just try to take a concrete example. I have a choice either to go on a free day, I can go out drinking with some friends to a bar, or I can go to Buddhist temple to hear a Dhamma talk. Okay, there are many, many conditions which have brought me to this present situation in which I'm facing this choice. And then there are different conditions that might be operating in my mind as I reflect on reasons for either going to out drinking with my friends or going to the Buddhist monastery to hear the Dhamma talk. But even though these conditions are acting on me, presenting me with this choice and pulling me in one direction or another, but finally the choice is my own. 
So there's no free will in the sense of a will operating completely apart from conditions, but in the present, we always have that capacity to make choices which are not compelled by the conditions. Maybe to use another example, let us take somebody who is a habitual cigarette smoker. And so he's been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for 10 years. And he has this very strong habit. So any day, this is sort of automatic reflex at certain times to light up and smoke. And this is a very strong condition bearing upon him. But first of all, he himself created that cigarette habit through his first decision to try a cigarette, smoking a cigarette, then after finding it very unpleasant, maybe even nauseating, <laughs> he still persisted and continued to smoke until little by little he built up that cigarette smoking until he's smoking a pack a day for 10 years. But now he's hearing from the health reports, smoking might be responsible for cancer, for heart disease, and so he makes a decision to stop smoking. Okay, so even though the time comes when he normally lights up and there's this powerful urge, powerful temptation, but he now has the choice to resist that. And if he has a strong enough will, then he can do so and break that out of it. Okay, please. So if I Let's take one question at a time. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure that I understood the question. Maybe you could phrase it more simply. There's quite a lot of what you said. <laughs> um, first of all, the person who is in the situation where they are acting, let us say, what we call irrationally, just out of habit without an awareness of what they're doing, 
first I would say at some level one is always aware of what one is doing. That one cannot say I'm acting without any awareness. Even though that awareness might be just a very, very small, very dull light of awareness, but it's still there. One is always aware of what one is doing. Um, it could be the case that people through, this would be through unwholesome actions in the past, have brought themselves into a situation in which they are conditioned by various negative conditioning factors that they will behave in unwholesome ways. Okay, but this is, again, it's through conditions that they've established in the past that they've brought themselves into this situation. Okay, the process of purification, of course, one has to begin at the coarser levels of the mind and gradually work down to subtle levels of the mind to achieve purification. I don't think this involves awareness of everything that one might say is preserved in the subconscious or unconscious. But let us just say, as one begins the work of mental cultivation, then one will purify successive levels of the mind until a pur purification seeps down to the very deep underlying levels of the mind. Um, the issue is for the regular mind, I'm not sure I think it's quite complicated, it's just for a well-trained mind to know. I struggle with a number of these issues, um, both socially and ethnic, you know, and I don't want to that down, but as much as the basis of belief in time behind and crime comes from, as far as I can tell, maybe two or three authorities, one is scriptural. Mm. And so we both the trust in the Lord of the Lord, which is asking us to have faith. And then I think that the image of God's Buddhism is saying, you can have a direct experience mm. of this reality. Mm -hmm. now, I'm far away from that experience, yeah. in all honesty. <laughs> um, so, and scriptural authority is that I'm not, uh, I'm taking my keys around the street by the time I'm doing that. Scriptural authority is, it's asking a lot of space of me mm -hmm. to follow this route. The other possibility, though, for authority is to find someone living yeah. who says they have had a direct experience mm -hmm. of this. And is there anybody in your experience who's had a direct experience of these persons of karma and past Yeah, there are several people. But again, <laughs> one also has to take take their word on trust. No, I, that's all we got. <laughs> Excuse me? That's all we have. Oh, so yeah. But so one thing I would say, though, is this one working? Yeah. Is that to practice the Buddha's teaching, one doesn't have to commit oneself to a belief in rebirth and karma to begin practicing the Buddha's teaching. One could take it on the basis of a teaching that one practices in this life itself or benefits to be experienced within this life itself. And we will get those benefits. Um, but what I, would, what I found is that as one practices and one reaps the benefits, then that sort of opens up a greater willingness to place trust in what the Buddha himself says. And also it's not only the Buddha, but many, many other like spiritual masters from other traditions, including in the Greek tradition, Protagoras, Plato, perhaps Plotinus have also spoken about rebirth. So it seems to have been a common theme within many of the contemplative spiritual traditions. Um. Oh. Um, you mentioned about the structural value uh, for the support of the mental body like this. Yeah. Uh, is there a value of the mental body? It might be what is called the mono, 
Mano Maya Kaya, the mind made body. Um, the the of the function of the Yes, yes. At least seeing and hearing, definitely. And I should say that my understanding of the subtle body which in which a being abides between existences comes not so much out of Buddha explicitly out of Buddha sex but accounts that I've read of people who have had the experience of passing away from a previous life and then they have memories of what took place after that before their rebirth into their present life and they speak about seeing themselves detached from their body, from their physical body and actually seeing their physical body lying on its deathbed and yet they're moving around in some kind of body which apparently resembles their previous body so they still have the same sense of personal identity so this must be a kind of subtle material body and they see and they hear with that body I haven't seen anybody who's described eating a meal and whether they can taste <laughs> who has the, oh, okay you have the microphone okay. I have a couple of quick questions over but um the question was you mentioned that karma is not that suitable for positioning, it's in the mood, it's your death and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is like you have some dead karma from the life and then you're searching around in different forms and how that lost is that karma what happens to the life will be you have that with you, even if you be on why, why wouldn't you carry that with you? Yeah, you said, yeah, the effect of the common mind is lost. I think it's unclear about Yeah, there are certain commas which by their nature <coughs> have to write them in this life or in the next life. If they're going to write them, that's where they will write them. But in order for a karma to write them, it has to meet with suitable conditions. And if those suitable can say there's a karma that's due to ripen in this life itself, but if the conditions for it to ripen don't come together, then it might not ripen. And if it doesn't ripen, then it loses its potency. It won't ripen. It will never ripen again. It becomes defunct. Similarly, is there a karma that might be due to ripen in the immediately next life? If it doesn't <coughs> doesn't <coughs> doesn't meet with conditions, then it won't ripen, then it becomes defunct. Does that help with the next resource then? And that that changes? Not really? Is that the right word? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I'm wondering if that karma, how was the cosmic karma, does that affect the cosmic karma of the universe or the spirituality? I should have said there'll be no karma in the universe. These are details I don't know. But my personal opinion would be that if one person changes their karma, so naturally going to affect other people. They're going to affect the people around them. Because changing your karma means you change your actions, your way of behavior. Or your ways of thinking, your ways of behavior. And so when individual changes through that person's actions, through the changing their thoughts, they're going to affect other people. <coughs> 